I think I, I think I know more about American Girl yeah. Doll than you do, You'll genius. never listen to any American Girl study. American Girl has always been one of those doll franchises that have just kind of been in the background for me. Although I've always loved dolls, I've never really given the brand much thought, either because they were too expensive or I just wasn't interested in the 18 inch style of dolls, but recently I've been getting more and more intrigued by them, especially as a pretty big history nerd and someone who studied fashion history. So I thought before I took the plunge into perhaps collecting them, I thought it would be fun to make a video out of it and just go through each historical girl to decide who I liked best. Since I am almost completely new to this, I wanted to make sure my rankings were as informed as possible. As a collector, and I'm probably in the minority of this, but I do really enjoy dolls with established characters, so I did read the books to get a proper feel of them. I didn't read every book because that would have taken 65 years, so I might have missed some stuff, but I did read a few for each girl, so I think I have a pretty good handle on them. Big shout out for sure to my Goodreads friends for watching me add 40 plus American Girl books in a week and minded their own business. So here are the tiers I will be sorting the girls into. The first one is, hey queen, girl you have done it again, constantly raising the bar for all of us. This is the tier for my absolute favorites, the best of the best. These are the girls who have both books that I loved reading and collections and outfits that are great and make me want to buy them. Came to eat, left a few crumbs. This is for the girls who I liked, but I just don't consider them one of my favorites. They probably do everything right, but it just comes down to my personal tastes or just one thing or another that keeps them from being top tier. Love your hair, hope you win. This tier is for the girls who I only liked one aspect of. Either I like their dolls, but didn't like their books very much, or I love their books, but didn't really enjoy their collections. So there was just a disconnect somewhere that kept me from really loving them. Y'all hear something? This is a tier for the girls that, although I can acknowledge they are still good dolls, I do not particularly enjoy them. Maybe I found them boring or unengaging, or I didn't enjoy their books, and their collections weren't cute enough to make up for that. And the last tier is straight clownery. I made this tier in anticipation of dolls that perhaps completely misrepresented their time period or did something particularly offensive or heinous that completely put me off from the doll. I wasn't sure I would need this tier, but sometimes with franchises revolving around historical time periods, you can never be too careful. Okay. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. We'll be going in order of release, starting of course with our three original girls. First, representing the 1940s is Molly McIntyre. Molly seems to be a pretty polarizing character. For some, she's an incredibly nostalgic fan favorite, but for others... is the nastiest skank bitch I've ever met. Do not trust her. As for me, I actually think I quite like her. I often see her called selfish or bratty, which isn't necessarily untrue, but I think her flaws also spawn some really great growth and character development. In her time period, the responsibilities thrust on children were almost backbreaking, and it was interesting to see her cope with those responsibilities while also just wishing for normal child things and wanting to be the center of attention. Her collection is not the most visually interesting, but it is very era appropriate, so I can't fault it too much for that. Her meat outfit is decently cute, and I think her glasses and her braids are super cute and unique, but my favorites are the ones not associated with any particular story, such as her after school outfit or her roller skating outfit. Her velvet Christmas dress is cute too. I'm going to put her in Came to Eat, Left a Few Crumbs. I do like her, but she's not quite top tier territory for me. Next, representing the 1900s, Samantha Parkington. So Samantha is one of the characters who represent the high class, and she also starts off pretty oblivious to her privilege. Some would argue that would make for a frustrating character, but I really liked her. I just found her to be very endearing, as she was very kind-hearted despite her privilege, as well as very bold and a little rough around the edges. Also, admittedly, her wealth did make for some interesting settings that really showed off her time period. 
Samantha's family dynamic was also very interesting, with her being an orphan raised by her other family members and her family later adopting more children. Overall, I can acknowledge that she didn't go through as many hardships as some other characters, but was still a very enjoyable and interesting character in her own right. Her stories also reminded me a lot of reading like Little Women or A Little Princess, which are two of my all-time favorite books, so there is a hint of nostalgia and bias in there as well. AG marketed her as a Victorian era girl, which is one of my favorite time periods aesthetically, but if we want to be technical, she is actually Edwardian and also American, but I can forgive her. Her clothes have influences from both eras, which would make sense. Her original collection is definitely one of my favorites. These outfits are so stunning. The tea dress, the spring party dress, the midi outfit, her birthday dress with the table set and the lemonade glasses and the birthday treats. Oh my god, it's all so cute. The Be Forever rebranding in 2014 definitely lost a lot of the accuracy in favor of random frills and floral prints, but it's not the worst they could have done. I'm putting Samantha in Hey Queen, Girl, You Have Done It Again. I really love her. Okay, last of the original trio. Kirsten representing the 1850s pioneers. I think Kirsten being one of the OG American girls is very important and significant because her being an immigrant doesn't at all diminish her status as an American girl. Her stories also touched upon a level of hardship not present in a lot of the other characters, which was kind of nice to see, but for the most part a little jarring. In her first book, her friend just dies tragically off screen and in another, she's responsible for burning down her family's home and then has to spend the night in a cave sleeping next to the rotting corpse of a complete stranger. Her books were honestly just kind of exhausting, because it often felt like her family's hardships weren't necessarily realistic to the struggles of pioneers, but due mostly to Kirsten's own terrible decision making. I also just don't remember much about her personality or character, other than the fact she tends to ruin people's lives wherever she goes. Her collection is also just not my favorite. The Little House on the Prairie aesthetic kind of thing is cute, I guess, but not really an aesthetic that I'm super enamored with. If I had to choose some favorites, I guess it would be her baking outfit, and I also think her bedtime set with her bed and her nighttime accessories looks fun. But even those, I never see myself like hunting down or anything. So I'm putting Kirsten in Y'all Hear Something? Sorry, Kirsten. Next is Felicity, representing the 1770s and the dawn of the Revolutionary War. Ah, Felicity, the horse girl to end all horse girls. Honestly, aside from that, not much about Felicity was a standout to me. I liked her well enough, but I found her stories to be more heavy-handed than most of the others and really didn't handle the more uncomfortable parts of her time period very well. She probably had my least favorite character development too, as I found her more rebellious and impatient personality much more endearing than her subdued passive one in the later books I read. I did notice that Felicity seems to have the most intense fans. Horse Girls, they gotta stick together I guess, but I often see them say they like Felicity because they're American history nerds, but like Aren't they all from American history? <laughs> like what? But I also love history and I really didn't think Felicity's story showed off her time period that well. Her collection is okay, like there's nothing wrong with it technically, but my issue is just that I feel like Felicity would hate most of these outfits in her collection. Like it's all just so flouncy and twee and I love that, but I would just feel bad putting Felicity in these. I wish there were more items that showed off her personality. She also has what is probably the worst Be Forever design. This dress is just so garish and doesn't even read revolutionary to me. Like, it almost looks like, like a Tudor gown, right? Am I the only one that thinks that? Anyways, Felicity goes in, y'all hear something. Now we have Addie Walker, representing the 1860s, the Civil War and Reconstruction era. I learned pretty quickly that Addie has a complicated legacy. Yes, A.G.'s first black doll being characterized as a runaway slave and packaging that doll for profit is uncomfortable, but also historically important in many ways. It's just that. Complicated. There's an article by Aisha Harris that I'll link below that opens a great discussion on the matter, including this quote here. 
Addie humanizes slavery for children, which is crucial since slavery by definition strips humanity away. But even just judging Addie on her own, removed from this context, I still really enjoy her. I think she's such an important, powerful character that still retains the childish charm and whimsy of the other characters, and that kind of representation is so significant. She's still a very relatable human character despite the traumatic circumstances surrounding her story. Some characters felt more like vehicles for morals to be taught and flaws to be ironed out, but Addie always felt very human. I also think her collection does a good job of giving her outfits that are interesting without being unrealistically intricate for her time and class level. Her birthday collection in particular is so cute, as well as her summer dress and the adorable little puppet studio. She's great. I'm putting her in Hey Queen, Girl You Have Done It Again. Next is Josefina Montoya, representing the 1820s. Josefina is the first character where her books are less about her specifically and more about her family as a whole. I'm not sure if it entirely worked in her favor because I find myself remembering less and less about her, but I still really enjoyed what I read and still think they're pretty important stories. I can really picture her books helping a young child uh, really deal with the loss of a parent, for instance. But I also just think maybe I don't like reading much about farm life. I just don't find that very interesting. There definitely needs to be more Latina historical girls in the lineup. And Josefina does her job well and she's great. But just she's not my personal favorite. So the best part of Josefina's collection is probably all the tasty looking foods that are in it. That might sound bad, but really it's more of a testament of how amazing all the food and cookware looks. She does have some great outfits like her fiesta dress or her Christmas dress in Mantilla, but again nothing that stands out as my personal favorites. I'm going to put her in Love Your Hair, Hope You Win. Next we have Kit Kidridge representing the Great Depression of the 1930s. I knew even before starting this video that Kit was a fan favorite, but honestly, I didn't like Kit that much uh, at first in her books. She just came off so mean-spirited for like no reason and very, you know, not like other girls. But she grew on me pretty quickly. I definitely see why people like her so much now. Yeah, she's a tomboy, but she doesn't really use that to demean more feminine interests like I initially feared. And the way she navigated her family's hardships during the depression really made her stand out as a character. She had some really great character growth, but unlike Felicity, she still retained the traits that made her so interesting. Her stubbornness, her wit, and her her curiosity. Kit's collection is also really cute and I especially like how many pieces uh, have that flower sack dress aesthetic that was pretty common during the depression and although she does have some super frilly pieces she also has plenty more utilitarian outfits that show off her personality and her interests. One thing I really do not like is her Be Forever redesigned meat outfit. I do not see anything 1930s when I look at that dress. It's just way too modern, but her classic collection is awesome enough that I can't excuse that. I'm putting Kit in Hey Queen, Girl, You Have Done It Again. Up next, we have Kaya, so far the earliest historical girl representing the 1760s. So there's some debate I noticed about the accuracy of Kaya's stories, but the amount of research and cooperation with the Nez Perce tribe that went in her creation definitely deserves some commendation. All the way down to the fact that Kaya's face mold has a closed mouth since showing teeth is a sign of aggression in her culture. She's definitely an important doll, and I think her character holds up to that standard as well. Her books did a lot to teach about her people's culture and way of life in her time period, and put her through some truly intense trials too. I really found myself rooting for her through them, though she definitely went to the Kirsten school of making bad decisions that almost ruin everyone's lives, which did make some of her stories rather frustrating. Most of Kaya's collection is actually modern outfits, which makes complete sense because historically speaking, I don't think she would have been like shopping for a bunch of different outfits, but it's also great that she's being used as a tool to educate about native practices and celebrations that still take place today. I think the outfits are gorgeous and Kaya herself is great. I'll put her in came to eat, left a few crumbs, but be noted that she's, she's very close to being top tier. Now we've entered the best friends era. 
Nellie O'Malley, the next character, is, I think, technically a part of Samantha's collection, but I will be counting the best friends separately for the sake of the video, even though they have way less content and items. Fortunately for Nellie, she was already a pretty major presence in Samantha's story. She represented the lower class foil to Samantha's privilege before becoming her adopted sister, but still felt very much her own character despite that, and not just a tool for Samantha's development. I identify more with Samantha personality-wise, but Nellie on a more practical level because I'm definitely not massively rich. The two had a very nice dynamic, and Nellie definitely stood on her own as a great character. Her collection is tiny, but deserves praise for the spring party dress alone. It's so cute, oh my god. And the little tiny porcelain doll? Yes, I'm being biased because I love the clothes from this time period, but what are you gonna do? Sue me? Well, call your lawyers because I'm putting Nellie in the top tier. I love her, and I can't separate her from Samantha. Next is Elizabeth Cole, who is Felicity's best friend. My issues with Felicity are pretty much repeated here with Elizabeth. Her time period just isn't handled the best, I didn't find her incredibly interesting. I guess she was intended somewhat to be the loyalist foil to Felicity's patriotism during the revolutionary period, but the books handle that conflict really terribly. The overall message seems to be that people can disagree on a political level and still be friends and have a right to their opinion, which isn't a bad message, but it's such a gross oversimplification of the issues of the time, and usually American Girl handles that kind of nuance pretty well. But they kind of dropped the ball on this one, and it ended up doing Elizabeth's character a disservice for it. She does have some very cute outfits, and they definitely suit her more than Felicity. Like, her tea lesson dress is very, very cute, and her summer outfit is great, but since she's a best friend, her collection is very small, and not enough to make up for my overall interest in her character. So she's joining her best friend Felicity in Y'all Hear Something? Next we have Molly's best friend, Emily Bennett. Emily was definitely a nice addition to Molly's story, but unfortunately just felt so minor, and I think more than the other girls, showed off the fatal flaw of the best friend's concept. With dolls as expensive as AG, a purchase needs to feel very justified, and I just don't think there was enough of Emily to really connect with her as a character. It didn't really feel like she had her own life at all. She wasn't even Molly's best friend, really. She just lived with her for like two weeks. And also, she wasn't even American. She was British. Um, but that said, I do think her inclusion did add an important second perspective to Molly's time period, and I still think she was a nice, enjoyable character overall. AG's historical girls tend to be very spirited and spunky characters, so it was nice to see one who's more shy and reserved. Emily's standout piece from her collection is definitely her meat outfit. It's probably one of my favorite outfits, period, from AG, actually. She has some other cute outfits too, like her holiday outfit and her swimsuit. Overall, she's very cute aesthetically, just not the strongest character. So she goes in, love your hair, hope you win. Next, representing the 1970s, is Julie Albright. Julie's stories were a little bit of an awkward adjustment because she was the most contemporary one at this point, but the 70s are such an interesting time that definitely deserve a spotlight, and I really enjoyed her in the end. Even though I didn't relate to her much on a spiritual level, like I've never touched any kind of sports ball in my life and I plan to keep it that way, she still had a very charming personality, and I love all the references to second wave feminism and what is probably one of the most mature and poignant portrayals of divorce in a children's book. Right down to Julie's mom admitting she divorced her dad partly for the sake of her own independence. Overall, I think AG did a wonderful job of creating a young character who gets swept up in activism and important causes without making her a caricature of activists, which is so often what these types of characters end up being. She actually ended up being one of my favorite characters by the end of it. Her collection is also really fun. Yeah, there's a pretty even split between her classic collection, which was an earnest attempt at representing children's fashion in the 1970s, and her Be Forever redesign, which already from the meat outfit looks more like a tacky Halloween costume. Pieces like her calico dress, her summer outfit, and her floral jumpsuit were already so perfectly funky they didn't need a redesign. I will at least say I'm slightly obsessed with the bathroom from the Be Forever lineup though. It's eye melting but in the best way. My gripes with her redesigned clothes aside, I'm putting her in Hey Queen, Girl You Have Done It Again. Honestly, even with the new meat outfit, she still 
downright one of the prettiest dolls. And now we have Julie's best friend, Ivy Ling. To get one thing out of the way, I think Ivy is thematically much more of an appropriate character to represent the 70s, but she is unfortunately relegated to being a part of Julie's collection as her best friend. Her books do a great job of showing off the experience of feeling caught between two cultures, as well as the fact that San Francisco's Chinatown in the 70s, where her family often visits and works, is such an exciting and interesting backdrop. It is unfortunate that she was discontinued so early considering she was AG's only Asian American historical doll and her collection is the smallest one of any doll to show for it. I'm honestly not a huge fan of her meat outfit and although the two extra outfits we got are nice, unfortunately I have to judge compared to the other girls and there is just barely anything to judge so I'm putting her in came to eat left a few crumbs. Uh, here's to hoping we get a mainline Asian American doll soon though. Next we have Kit's best friend Ruthie Smithens. I kind of adored Ruthie. I actually didn't pay much mind to her in Kit's stories because she was honestly kind of a burdensome character being a rich girl during the Great Depression and all, but her book actually showed a side of her that I kind of fell in love with. No, she didn't necessarily have an important or groundbreaking story to tell, but that's okay. I loved how the book was formatted like a fairy tale to represent her own love of magic and fairy tales, and she's just a very charming character. Granted, she doesn't have the collection that the mainline characters have, so I do have to rank accordingly, but her pieces are cute enough that it keeps her up pretty high. I love her play outfit, and her little pink satin pajamas just make her look so fancy. She goes in, came to eat, left a few crumbs. Next, we have Rebecca Rubin, representing the 1910s. Rebecca was given somewhat of an awkward time period, making her one of the few characters where the emphasis is more on her family and background more than the history. I can definitely tell how much love went into writing her stories and the opportunity to share the experiences of a family of Jewish immigrants, especially in regards to the domination of Christian holidays and traditions. To rate Rebecca as a character is difficult though. Her stories rarely felt rooted in their time period, and I get that the 1910s weren't the most exciting decade, but I often found myself forgetting they took place in the past at all. It's odd, I know, that her time comes only a decade after Samantha, who has my favorite time period, so I just feel like it was underutilized. As much as I was endeared by Rebecca's attention-seeking habits and her desire to be an actress, I just think she falls short of her role as a historical character. Rebecca's another character that was completely overhauled by the heinous Be Forever branding. I don't mind her Be Forever Me outfit compared to her original one so much, actually, but I still very much prefer her classic collection overall. Her Hanukkah outfit is so adorable, her school outfit is great, her movie premiere dress is so fabulous. Again, none of this needed a redesign. I, I don't know, should I be ranking only by the outfits that are actually available? Or probably not, right? Uh, in any case, Rebecca goes in, love your hair, hope you win. Moving on to our next character, or characters rather, representing the 1850s, Cecile Ray is an interesting case as she was released alongside Marie Grace as a duo. They also overlap with Kirsten's time period, but in my opinion are much more interesting and honestly my second favorite time period next to Samantha's. Antebellum New Orleans featuring a prominent wealthy black character predating Addie in a city with a complex racial history that addresses social hierarchies within communities of color. It's that level of nuance that I've come to expect from AG. And I even found myself learning a lot about pre-Civil War in New Orleans. Cecile as a character just adds so much to the historical lineup due to how many expectations she defies, but her run was cut criminally short. Still, she endures as one of my favorite characters. Cecile's best outfit is definitely her meat outfit, but she has some interesting extra pieces. I love that you can buy her parrot, and her special dress is also super cute, and she probably has my favorite nightwear too. I'm putting her in Hey Queen, Girl You Have Done It Again. Next, Marie Grace. 
As Cecile's companion character, she has the benefit of sharing her extremely interesting setting and time period, so she's already off to a good start. Unfortunately, it's difficult not to compare her and Cecile, and I just find myself drawn much more to Cecile. I do still think Marie Grace is a great character in her own right, and I like the perspective of a doctor's daughter during the yellow fever epidemic, but she was just overshadowed by her friend, and I found myself questioning if she was truly necessary. That sounds almost awful to say, but it was them being a duo that led to them being discontinued so early. So with all that in mind, I just have a hard time ranking her as high as Cecile. And I know it's mostly appropriate for the time period, but Marie Grace's me outfit is not my favorite, which is saying something because pink is my favorite color, and her party dress is also one of the most unfortunate dresses I've seen so far. Her skirt set is pretty cute though, but she goes in, love your hair, hope you win. Next, representing the War of 1812, is Caroline Abbott. It seems to be a pretty common idea that Caroline is the most boring American girl, and on first glance, I get it. She's yet another blonde girl set in the War of 1812, a time period that's very often overlooked. Boring, however, she is certainly not. A lot of the girls have periods that revolve around wartime, but Caroline's stories revolve around her being instrumental in protecting her town from an invasion or helping her father or escape from imprisonment. It never read like her efforts were overstated either and felt very plausible even despite her young age, so I'm impressed with that balance. Caroline also has one of the prettiest collections despite its small size due to her early retirement. Her me outfit is simple but very elegant. The parlor alone is such a beautifully stunning playset, but her holiday dress is amazing, her birthday dress is great, and I love her work dress. I'm putting her in, came to eat, left a few crumbs, mostly just due to the size of her collection, and even though I liked her books well enough, they weren't my favorites. Next up, representing the 1950s, is Mary Ellen Larkin. I did not dislike Mary Ellen by any means, but I guess my issue with her is that she's very safe. The 1950s are thematically a very interesting time period, if a little quiet compared to others on the list, but outside of poodle skirts and a weird playground analogy to the Cold War, Mary Ellen's series just didn't heavily engage with it. They went the most expected route for most things, and at this point in Agee's life, I just expected more. Even Mary Ellen's characteristics, seeking attention, feeling ignored in a big family, and a desire to be famous, all feel recycled from some of her predecessors. She's a little unique in the fact that she survived polio and has some weakness in one of her legs for it, but that was altogether a very minor detail about her. Like her stories, Mary Ellen's clothes are pretty much exactly what you would expect, but in this case that's not necessarily a bad thing. She of course has her poodle skirt which is super cute, her back to school outfit is very cute, her pretty pink dress is quite stunning, her birthday dress is dreadful though. Her furniture sets are very cool too, particularly the diner set and the fridge, but I don't necessarily see how these are connected to her as a character. Overall, I'm putting Mary Ellen in. Y'all hear something? Next, representing the 1960s is Melody Ellison. I thoroughly enjoyed Melody. Her aesthetic, her personality, her books, they were all great. I really enjoyed the fact that unlike other characters who had aspirations of being famous, Melody had a much less confident, more reserved personality. There's a lot of characters that I noticed have become only more relevant with time, but Melody seems to stick out as the most significant. I think she really represents AG at its best. Dolls that are just as much tools for education and processing historical trauma as they are playthings. Melody accomplishes her job as a lens into the civil rights movement while still being a fun, engaging character, which in the long run is equally as important. Melody's collection is also super cute, it's so 60s in the best way. I'm a huge fan of her daisy outfit, her school outfit, and her really, really adorable pajamas. Her little case of traveling essentials is also so cute. She's going in, hey queen, girl you have done it again. Next is Nanea Mitchell, also representing the 1940s. Nenea is interesting because her time period overlaps slightly with Molly, and although it's not the first time they've done that, it's the first time it was done to kind of very pointedly show another perspective to a previously covered event. 
In Nanea's case, she is experiencing World War II like Molly, but as a native Hawaiian. And AG did a very good job, I think, of filling in the gaps that Molly's story didn't or otherwise couldn't quite fill. So I definitely hope they do that sort of thing again. But the reason I really love Nanea is because more than anyone else, except maybe Samantha, I related the most to her. Despite the massive differences in our circumstances, I still really saw a lot of myself as a child in her, right down to her overachieving nature and love of Nancy Drew novels, and that's really the magic of American Girl, isn't it? She also has a very beautiful collection, down to what is one of my all-time favorite birthday dresses, a really gorgeous luau dress, and also her super super cute school dress too. Nenea also goes in, hey queen, girl, you've done it again. And last, but certainly not least, Courtney Moore, representing the 1980s. Courtney was great. Some people really don't like her, I noticed, because they feel like the 80s is too contemporary of a time period. But Molly's time period was only about 40 years old on her release, so I don't really get it, personally. Plus, the advantage of a relatively recent time period means we get an author who actually lived through that decade, as is with the case with uh, the author of Courtney's books, and it shows brilliantly. It feels very genuine in so many things. The Challenger explosion, the HIV epidemic, the misogyny present in video game culture, it was all handled so beautifully. Courtney's personal life was also really nice to read about too, and I really identified with her struggling with a blended family and her big imagination. She's great. I'm glad we ended on such a good note. Her collection is criticized pretty heavily for being pretty stereotypically 80s and relying on nostalgia, which, yeah, they're not totally wrong, but while I couldn't see a grown woman wearing this stuff in the 80s, I could absolutely see a 10-year-old girl rocking the splatter print dress or all the acid wash denim her Care Bears pajamas. It's so much fun. And even a miniature Molly doll that comes with a miniature catalog with items she wants circled in it. That's so cute. Courtney absolutely goes in. Hey queen, girl, you have done it again. And that's my ranking. If you made it this far, thank you so much. I know it was pretty long, but what can I say? I have opinions on dolls. Looking at it, I think I feel pretty confident in my rankings, and I'm really happy to report that absolutely no one went in the bottom tier. If you disagree with any of these, that's perfectly fine. This was all in good fun, and I would actually love to hear about your favorites and why you would have ranked some girls differently than me. I definitely came out of this with a newfound appreciation for American Girl and the brand, and would really like to hear your experiences, if any, with these dolls. Thanks so much for watching. Please like or subscribe for more videos like this. It was a lot of fun to do, and definitely I have many more planned in the future. Thank you.